I am David Gray, uh, musician, songwriter. A good deal, uh, because I, the, the formative period of put, since putting my first record out, that seven or eight years before success really kicked in, uh, some of it was quite a sort of harrowing experience. And it stays with you. It gives you a perspective on things. Um, so uh, it, it also, it stood me in good stead in, in a way. Uh, well, <laughs> we all know that the world functions on nonsense. Uh, and so it sort of debunked a few sort of myths and stripped away, uh, cleaned my eyes a little bit as to how things worked. And 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 also it allowed me to develop some relationships which proved to be very important. Um, whereas if success had come very quickly and you just immediately turn into a pound sign in, the, in everyone's eyes, it's more difficult to to form sort of, but you need, there's a degree of nurture that's necessary if longevity is what you're after, you know. Um, so, uh, in, but yes, really the way that I saw the world when occasionally people will put the question to me, do you ever pine for these days when, you know, you were free of, of all this, you know, whatever uh, press or hassle or, you know, people being on your case in this way and you were sort of this sort of very credible, obscure artist. But that's just a, a fantasy that people have. They just put those two words together. I said, if you knew what it was actually like, you'd never wish anyone back there. It's like the toilet tour, as it's known, when you're playing the, you know, smallest and least pleasant venue in town on a regular basis is not for the faint-hearted and anyone should just watch the Anvil film repeatedly. Uh, it's like Spinal Tap in the back of the bus used to be quite a sort of painful experience to watch, as funny as it is, because it was that close to the bone. And they'd at least been successful and were now less so. <laughs> I was billed under spare ribs famously at one club. It, spare ribs sold out, David Gray, nine o'clock. But, I mean, that's putting a... I, I went through many of permutations of the same sort of miserable story. Uh, and yeah it's it's not it's not for the faint hearted so uh that stuff stays with you and i think success comes that negotiating success uh is equally complicated uh and uh riddled with illusion as well a, a lot of it of your own creation i think the world of success is a much more self conscious place it's like essentially a hall of mirrors that shines you a distorted view of yourself back repeatedly from many different angles until you start to get a bit paranoid about what everybody thinks about you and I think everybody has to go through that and I don't think it completely leaves you you are essentially exposed and vulnerable and you're in the public eye and you can be criticized or categorized or drawn as a sort of cartoon version of yourself freely by people uh, however they see fit and you just have to live with that there's no way of winning and it's like you just look worse the more you struggle and resist, the more people try and enclose you in a little bubble. And you go, no, that's not me. I'm deep and meaningful. I'm, you know, uh, or whatever, whatever it is you're particularly trying to prove. Uh, you just, it's just quicksand. And the more you struggle, the quicker you sink. The only way to escape is through the grandeur of surrender. I'm just not giving a fuck about the whole thing. And uh, getting a sense of perspective above and beyond. So I think... Um, having an audience is a wonderful thing and should never be taken for granted uh, much as it, it should also be your job as an artist to challenge them as well as you challenge yourself and you just give them what they want but uh, it's it's uh, it, it's it, it's playing music is it's got to be one of the best jobs in the world so um, if ever you're sort of torturing yourself to the point that you can't see that then you've lost your perspective. So um, uh, I, I think that unquestionably, just like a plant having a bit longer to get its roots down into this uh, earth, uh, y yes, the early years were useful in a way because when I started out, I was totally green as to what the music business even was. What was this modus operandi? I didn't know, I didn't care. Making a record was like someone was giving me some money to make a record. That was just 
enormous. You know, that was all I cared about. And um, beyond that, I didn't have a clue what was going to happen. I didn't have world domination penciled in the diary. You know, it wasn't like uh, that was on my radar. It was just get to make another record. Um, that was basically it. Try and find some people who want to listen to the music. And strangely, it all sort of made its own sort of sense that the music got out there. And even though I couldn't really tell, it did do something. The first record, it lit a few fires and those ended up being vital because some of them were in Ireland, which became a stronghold for me. And then that was eventually the springboard to my success. So I guess coming upon the whole thing gradually, and I would say this about was obviously advantageous in some ways, but uh, just to even to make it to the point where I became successful could be considered <laughs> an achievement of, of sorts because it wasn't particularly easy. Uh, but uh, when success comes and everything that comes with it, it doesn't matter how long you've been in obscurity, it doesn't make the transition any easier, I, I think. I think it's just an ongoing project. Uh, I, I just, for many reasons, I feel like things have taken on a certain perspective now. Uh, and I'm in a very good place with it all. I, I'm, I'm at, at, at ease as much as I could be with the whole thing. In a weird way, my greatest hits record was a very sort of cathartic experience because I don't think I'd completely acknowledged what had happened. Some of it I wasn't very comfortable with. For example, the record I made directly after my very successful record, for all kinds of reasons, some of them to do with me, some of them to do with other things, it, it didn't come together in the way that it should have done, and it was a kind of anemic end product. It went on to sell loads of copies simply because the record before it had been so popular, and this is the way it works. So it got a lot of attention, and people liked the first one so much, or the White Ladder so much. So I'd never kind of really even wanted to look. It was just like, that happened, now I've got to get back to what I do best, which is reconnecting. But you've got to acknowledge everything that happened. You, you can't leave large portions of time sort of unaccounted for. <laughs> it's like, so uh, that weirdly putting the greatest hits together and then going out and playing all these songs, which I hadn't even wanted to touch for so long, it brought them all back to me and it sort of made me whole again. Well, that and time, I mean, White Lad is the sound of me escaping from the demons of say, failure or lack of success or lack of attention or all the sort of doubt and negativity and accusatory glances you're throwing in the direction of the world and the media, all perfectly justified, but uh, they don't get you anywhere. And essentially you have to ask yourself the question, oh, have I got anything else to give? Can I, can I do better? You know, whether the record company did a bad job or you know, journalists are some sort of strangely disappointing breed of human that should be shot with a crossbow at every opportunity, whatever you happen to think. It's, uh, could I do more? Can I give more to my music? Could I have done more? And I, and I knew I could, so, all right, let's go again, kind of thing. And this, that record is very open-hearted, and there's no fear or, I put everything in there, and that's one of the reasons it connects, I think, in a big way. It's not defensive, there's no defensive stance to it. It's just very open, very melodic. Um, and this record is I've just made is like the sound of me escaping from the demons of success in a way, the sort of com complicated bag of complexities that, that comes in with the package you get with success and audience and millions of people suddenly getting involved. There's a strange vertigo that comes with that uh, and it, it takes some adjusting to. But yeah, the, 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 the greatest hits thing somehow was part of a, a coming to terms with the whole thing for me, which was very healthy. Also, I was changing a lot behind the scenes, a new band. I'd made a lot of very empowering decisions, and suddenly music came back to me very, very strongly. And, and, and my, my work was very, very alive for me, and I've never been so connected to it. And as a writer, I mean, obviously, lyricism, lyrics, lyrics are the, a very big part of what I do. Um, I've never enjoyed myself more than at this current time with, with the writing aspect. And there's a real vivacity in the work, and a, and a joy of language, and a and uh, expression that, uh, well, I think it shines through. So uh, it's like I've started all over again in a weird way. So I, I, also life passes so quickly. It's like you, start, you do, as you get a bit older, you, you think, well, hang on, you know, I'm 40, 41. 
I better get on with it. You know, I mean, what, what's this farting around? If you can't give fear ten percent or fifteen percent of you, it's like that's a wasted life. Even that much, you you you've got to live completely and unguardedly, and that's the only way you can defeat all the sort of cynicism that's out there, is just by being open-hearted. I think as an artist. You sort of know the shape of fame, but until it f rests upon you, you, you don't really know what it feels like. So, but that's not really uh, unexpected. One of the unexpected things that happened was a wonderful thing. I was offered the opportunity to play in a charity football match. Uh, so my dreams of being a musician, they go back a long way, but being a, a playing a famous football game that goes back even further. So I got the chance, because of my fame and no other reason, to play. Robbie Williams had this massive UNICEF charity football with many, many very famous footballers, old retired footballers involved and celebrities. And England took on the rest of the world. It was staged at my team's ground, Manchester United, Old Trafford, in front of 75,000 people live on national television with a week's training with the England coach. Hey, the whole thing was ridiculous, ludicrous, but it was complete fantasy. And I got to play with people I'd watched as a, you know, as a kid, uh, and against some of the most famous. That that was unpredictable. That was absolutely incredible. That was like, oh, what a, what a thing! It's in its own little time capsule in my head. It's like I remember looking out the hotel window and seeing all these famous footballers sort of saying goodbye to each other the next day, and I realised it was over. I could hardly walk because I just played ninety minutes of. <laughs> chasing the ball <laughs> so that that was that I'll treasure forever and that would never have happened I've got into a few restaurants and I've had a few wacky experiences that I I wasn't bargaining on uh, all because of my newfound fame so but that was the most notable thing I seem to be seeing everything slightly differently it's sort of totemic presence casts a long shadow right across everything I'll do forever. Uh, it did the numbers, do you know what I mean? People like numbers, you know. So it, it, it proves something, apparently. <laughs> so, but it, it was a special record. I'm like, I won't get drawn into what's best and what's better. All you try and do is to get tap into that magic again, but in a different way, in a different place. It had a magic to it. It was fearless in its own small way, and uh, it didn't let you down as a record. So people knew they could go. When we when we made it, we tried to make a record that would just flow from the very first note right to the end without you may, ever wanting to go like, oh no, don't like this one, skip. It was very much supposed to have that, because I felt like I hadn't accomplished that since my first record. And that it, things have been too schizophrenic. It's like I want to be loud. I want to be quiet. I want to do. I want to be rocky. I want to... So that was. We had a very limited palette, which helped in a way. So we set it within this new world that we'd found of weird little samples and things. So yet that record has a magic to it, and just because it became ubiquitous uh, doesn't lessen the depth of some of the music. It's it, it's it's got soul. So uh, it's. It will always be there and something that people seem to have a real deep affection for in a kind of tapestry by Carol King type way. It's like it's like one of those, everyone can listen to it. So it, it, it sort of, from the moment of its inception, when we started to play it, you could just see the, the breadth of the different types of people who were getting into it. It started so small and the audience were younger and, and cooler because it was like a cult audience in Ireland, and then it grew and just in, began to involve everybody. Uh, well, great. God bless the Irish. Certain kinds of things can, can, it's, can still happen there that are much harder to, to get off the ground in the UK. So um, it's a wonderful place. It's a magic place, you know, and uh, the word counts for a lot there. The passion, you know, for for, for expression, it, it's like the thing is, it's changed a lot since I've been going there. It's become much more European, 
that sort of homogenized, wealthier sort of look has sort of has seized some parts of it. But still, when you go west and you get out there, you'll see a different world. Well, people don't have a great deal of money, you know, and life is very simple. But there are huge passions, sports and music and writing and ideas. So, yeah, it's so very different from England, you know, in so many ways. There's something that, that happens over there that, that anyway, I've been the beneficiary of. Uh, so there's, there's an Irish magic, for sure. Um, and that, well, what, what more can I say about it, really? I mean, that was just an unbelievable chapter. The success that happened there and the lengths that it went to are, are difficult to comprehend, really, even now. It's not a selfless act. You know, it, it's, it's an obsession. It's like, it's taken a huge part of me. It is a huge part of me. You know, I've, I've poured so much into it and it, it, it just wants more. It's, a, it's the beast that wants more. So music and the ideas and writing songs is it, just, it has a huge chunk of me. Uh, and I, I'm always thinking of how, uh, you know, how, how can I get, it's like a new path to the waterfall is the title of a Raymond Carver book. How do I get there again? Do you know what I mean? And will it be even better this time? That song. Most of you, you, you work away at it, work away at it. And the more you work, the more likely it is that you'll write a good one. But that really good one, just they just you don't know when they're going to turn up. They, you, you can't make it happen. That just that really magic song that happens once every few years or whatever, if you're lucky. You know, well, how do I get more of that stuff? And then, of course, y you make it right so that people can plug into it right. It's a connection. Music's a connection. It's like if you make a song that has all the nerve endings on the outside of it, that people can sense it, how alive it is and how alive they are through the listening to it, then it's just that that's that's what you want. You want to connect. You're not in a bubble, but it, it's it, you're not making it for them. In the making of it, you're thinking of other people encountering it. I'm clearly not of that generation, so I really wouldn't know. I mean, it's just, this is how people glue themselves together now. The world is ludicrously fast, and this is one way of letting everybody know. So, unsurprisingly, the next generation utilise it as a means of, like, you know, and, and then it's per perceived by lots of older, middle-aged, middle-class journalists as being, like, cool and somehow exciting. It's like everyone's desperate for something new to write about, so it gains attention. It really is pretty unremarkable, isn't it? People just put words down or send a photo in or something. Uh, I, I don't even know how all these things work. It does, it, the idea of communicating more than I currently do is just... Uh, not really on my radar. I, 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 I'm looking for a world where there's less communication. I, I'm just not sure how far the empowerment goes. Um, it's still about attracting attention, albeit in a different way. And those people with the greatest influence will get the most attention. And the odd story will crop up, which will sort of... There's a, the new thing, you know, something new that no one's heard of before that they pass around like really fast. That's what happened with White Ladder. It was something new and it got passed about. Uh, so you see, that will happen to the odd thing. But I don't see a sort of radical new way of selling music that, that favours the smaller producer kind of thing. It, it just, you know, uh, people like iTunes are desperately trying to keep their page sort of free from like, being just bought out, period, by every all the interested parties. So things take place in a slightly more sort of convoluted way. You give them loads of free stuff and hours and hours of your time and they'll semi-guarantee that you'll get some good coverage or something on their, their front page. You, that's how it works, sort of thing. It's, like you, it's sort of gifting rather than just naked financial ruthless power seizing their front page. Like, Here's loads of money. We want this artist on the front for a month. Because so everyone will know every time they click on, bang! Oh, they've got a new record out. So, I, but this stuff will eventually prevail, I dare say. To say I'm not a fan of the music industry 
is like, I've spent enough money with it and enough time persevering with it. It's, it's obviously been, it's been born of, it's, 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 it was very greedy and it's basically a history of ripping people off is how it made so much money. And then they developed the CD and went, hey, hey, this is good. We can sell all the same music again in a different format. And they thought, this is the future. And at that point, they dropped the ball completely and utterly. They started to give things away on promotional sort of, and the gross sort of incompetence of the whole thing is laughable, really. Um, this is a very cold, it's a cold-hearted digital world that doesn't seem to care much for music or sort of nurturing it because there's infinitesimal reward for zillions of hits on YouTube or whatever. So it just doesn't work as a formula. Music doesn't come for free. Strangely enough, people spend hundreds of thousands of pounds and many years producing things. It's like, that's why it sounds good. Changing the band was a huge decision, but one that kind of came to me gradually. But really during the making of Life in Slow Motion in 2004 and 2005, I already knew. I could sense that Whatever it had been there once wasn't there anymore. Things come and go and people change. And obviously we'd been through a lot together. We'd been very compressed, making records, touring, da -da -da, TV studios, all rubbing against each other. and Everyone needs a bit of space. But also everyone makes sense of success in a different way. And I think some people try and sort of hoard it and so as if it proves something. Whereas for me, I find that it's useless beyond the point of itself. And it doesn't mean you're justified making a, another good record, you, just because you've made a good one once doesn't justify the next one. It, it moves on, as you see, at an alarming rate. People make a great record and you never hear from them again. What happened? Did they sort of, did something get trapped inside their heads that shouldn't be there? You know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's like that. So there's a degree of transparency. Necess, necess, you have to sort of surrender the past, go, okay, that was all well and good, here we go again, because you have no right to the next thing you do etc etc so I felt that this certain people were looking at things differently and there was a degree of complacency which isn't there for me when I write and do things but but basically it was just it wasn't as much fun or it wasn't as sparky as it could have been and I sensed the thing you fear the most which is that we were going to repeat ourselves any time now but also I throw out throw out certain sort of ideas sort of templates of ideas in terms of the way I'll form chords or the kind of tempo of songs or the mood of songs and with the same people will react in a similar way, unless they have some, you know, rabid, ferocious appetite for reinvention, you know, uh, unless they're all little individual radio heads, you know, who want to sort of tear everything up just for the sake of it. You find that you start to make the si same kind of songs, and um, that's what was starting to happen. It was a difficult thing to say goodbye, particularly to Clune, because he's, well, they were all very talented people, and we'd had a, a brilliant time, and they'd done great things. But um, Clune was the big one. He was there with me through all the years of misery and hardship, nearly all of them anyway, missing the first couple. Uh, and is such a big hearted guy and was such the heartbeat of my whole sound for a while. So saying goodbye to Clune was a really big deal. So I went and saw him personally and there's nothing, there's no nice way of putting it. I just basically said, I need a new challenge and I'm gonna have to move on. I don't know what the future holds, we might work together again. So these things are awkward moments. Well, I, th he, I think he sensed it was coming. So he just thought that maybe I was moving in a sort of direction that he didn't really want to go in. And he sort of said that, you know, you're, you seem to be wanting to go back more to this almost like a folky type of sound. Uh, and he was more interested in, you know, more the pop element. And that's how he sort of worked it out for himself, that I was going off on a different tangent slightly. So, uh, you know, good luck kind of thing. So it was, that was, but it, the, it was difficult getting rid of everything when there was nothing yet to replace it. But as soon as I, you have the need, then you find people and you find what you need. It's like, it's, it's, it's interesting how it works. It's like, it makes you realize, as, uh, you know, that you never hear the melody until you're needing the song. So it's a Tom Waits lyric, but just that, applying that metaphor to many things in life, it, it's true of people, 
and it's true of all kinds of things, it's like if you're incredibly wealthy and there's actually no reason for you to do what you do pretty much, you can sort of tell yourself you're still doing it for the right reasons, but it definitely changes the equation. You know, but if you absolutely need, you've spent all your money on some crazy sort of binge or on the, you know, or whatever, holidays, you know, um, Ferraris, you know, toy soldiers, it doesn't really matter. But then you've got nothing suddenly and then you have to, it, it, there's a different fire to that when you're powered by the fact you actually do need material things and you're going to have to get them quick. It, it puts you in a different headspace. That was basically the headspace I was in for this record because we chose not to sign all our deals. We chose to sort of go it alone because it was a changing world and a brave new world would be coming along anytime soon. No one told us about the dead horse that we were actually <laughs> staring at. Uh, the world of diminishing returns was the only one that was actually coming around the corner. But uh, we, we felt it was better to be free within that than shackled to some dying beast. Uh, and so, uh, but as a consequence, the, the finances, every aspect of making the record was very much, uh, it was a, there was a much more sober light cast on everything which I think is vital. And when financial stuff was going down and my own finances got messed up, it was very real and it was, uh, it was quite stressful actually. But I actually thought it was good. It was like, well, at least we're in the real world, fucked like everyone else. It's like, rather than sort of reclining on some giant pillow of wealth, sort of sympathizing with people. It, it, it wasn't like that and it didn't feel like that. So they, there's a, there's a there was something positive about it. There was an element of risk, not only creative risk, uh, in, in changing everything uh, and in the way we recorded, which was basically all or nothing. We either get the take with the vocals or we don't get anything. Uh, and likewise, in the, the, in the broader sense of the business side of it, which always has a huge amount to play in, in the making of any creative project, what the thinking was around it and behind it. Uh, so uh, anyway, it, they, we were sort of on similar lines on lots of different levels and that's led to the sort of vitality of what this is, which I think is very plugged in to just being alive now. Sometimes you sort of offer the music out as some sort of fragile bloom into a hostile space and you're like, please like me, you know, don't heckle in the middle of this one, you know. <laughs> uh, it's like, it, it's like, church music in an inappropriate setting or something sometimes it is very sensitive and or there's a lot of sort of emo emotion to it and a couple of my recent records have been very emotional and sort of inward and so it, it's harder to you know take those songs out to the crowd in a way you need them to be on your side because obviously it's often a bit more challenging than that live these songs are very outward they're very direct they've got a bit more pace and a bit more attitude and it's fantastic to have that in the engine room sort of thing, all this different gearing. But it's also the way that I'm feeling. I want to, I'm looking the world squarely in the eye and I, I just can't wait to sing out all this stuff. And I've already seen it have an effect. We've done a few shows already. Uh, uh, I can see the music registering. It's very direct. So um, yeah, that's very exciting. Well, I think I've had a break as well. You know, I was a bit torn out. So. I'm full of beans in, in that sense. It's like, I I'm really have a, uh, I'm longing to just play the shows. I mean, that, that, so yeah, it's, it's great having this, this record and, and what it's got on it. I think it shines a light on more facets of my writing and my head, you know, than, than previous records, which were, pitched sort of in a certain place. Uh, you know, I've been in quite an inward zone. Well, I was post-fame and post a few deaths, you know, uh, and the strain in my private life and the, the strain of just being away all the time and having young children and all this stuff going on and trying to f work out how best to deal with it all. It seemed to send me inward, but I... I've suddenly, yeah, you know, I've freed up, and it's like it reminds me a bit of my first record. This record, it's very divergent. There's not one song that typifies it. There's lots of different types of stuff, but in terms of the ideas and the the 
that it presents and the wit of some of it, I think it's far more reflective of me as a whole. Because people talk to me sometimes and they, I don't know what they're expecting, but they, they can't believe I've got ideas or I give a fuck or I might punch someone in the face. It's like, well, of course, I'm a human, you know. Are you not offended? It's like, life's hard to swallow, isn't it, most of the time? It's like you can't move an inch without a salesman pitching you on some fucking bullshit they've dreamt up. It, it's like, it's a constant struggle just to stand still, not be overcome by a sense of loathing. And yet it's completely wonderful as well. I don't know. So I guess, yeah, I, I'm delighted with this record in that respect. I feel that it's a, it's a work of greater maturity in terms of the writing. And I do think there are songs on there that are very like things I've written before, like Jack Daw, sort of ballads that people can probably latch on to immediately. And that well, all the songs on there I've written something sort of similar-ish to, but it's just better constructed. And then there are things like Nemesis on there, which I think sort of transcend anything I've managed to do so far. I think they're much more elegant uh, constructs than what I've, I've tried to say the same thing, but I've not said it as well. Which is basically, that's all we're, we're up to is saying the same thing in different ways. I've had a few records with producers and various entanglements with them. Working with Marius on slow motion was a, a very successful uh, project. And at that point, I just bought this big studio. I really needed a little help in learning how to use it or to think within the scope that it offered me. So I'd just basically been making records in a very sort of bedroom way. And that's how I'd found my sound, finally, or learnt to relax in the studio. A producer gives you objectivity. You know, he's not actually playing the music. He's sitting there listening. And obviously, it, it, whenever you get someone like that, it can be very, very helpful in all things. So, and he supposedly helps people to express themselves or relax within the whole thing or try something they wouldn't have tried or has ideas. I mean, you know, some artists are pretty clueless and they need somebody to do everything for them. And then you get, but I think the, pretty much all the interesting artists will have very strong ideas about how it should be. But some people aren't very practical or they've not got very good people skills. It's a polite way of saying they're rude fucking twats. Uh, uh, <laughs> And uh, they, they need somebody who can sort of get everybody working together. So, uh, you know, they think that there's some sort of divine presence that's going to come in and sort of create magic. So it, it's like, anyway, sometimes it feels like you need some external influence, some objectivity and a little bit of magic from somewhere, a little bit of guidance. Well, I'd heard Marius, he'd made lots of interesting records and quite grand. He was obviously quite sort of baroque in his sort of soundscapes and uh, that was completely running contrary to the way that I would normally do things. So it made for an interesting combina combination. But this time around, I think if the magic's happening in the band, then that's what you're looking for the producer to create. And then I knew exactly what to do with this. It was it was right up my alley. Funnily enough, it was my music. But I mean, it was it, it you didn't have to do much with it because we were getting a live take which has a certain sort of thing to it. Everything glues together in a certain way when you record like that. And you don't need to lash loads of stuff on it to make it sound convincing. It is convincing, it's the real thing. It sounds good just as, it, as the naked truth of what it is. So overdubs and all that, it, it was obvious where the, the big gestures needed to be made production wise. But I guess I gained a lot of confidence slowly over the years about my own opinion and being able to express it. I think the big problems I had in the studio when I was younger was I couldn't really articulate what I wanted. I couldn't speak drummer language or, or engineer language. I didn't know what all the knobs did on the desk or whatever, but slowly I've gleaned little bits of important information and terminology down the years and I can just about express myself without pissing everybody off. So it's often people will get pissed off when you're not trying to piss them off, you're just trying to explain what it is you want, but th th all they know is you don't like what they're doing right now. It might be that they're only seven inches away from the thing you actually do want, but you can't quite get them there. I'm wary of these phantom thoughts because really I know I'm not gonna get a chance to do anything for a while. So you think, wouldn't it be good if, or yeah, I've got all that stuff going on all the time. I sort of take notes and 
I, usually I stop writing completely when I'm on the road, but for some reason I haven't this time. So I'm still, the writing, the word part of my brain hasn't turned off. So I've got a couple of songs I'm sort of finishing. So I, I, I guess there's quite a lot of stuff left over from this mammoth recording session we did over the last few years. And a few unresolved things too. And I'm trying to resolve some of those and I'm having, so, um, it's it's always ongoing, and I think um, that 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 seems to be the way that it is. It, it it just it just keeps coming, keeps me up at night. Well, what keeps me up at night is generally uh, mainly music related. So it'd be stressing about stuff to do with a song or recording, something that's not right, or trying to find words that I don't have yet for a song. Now, when I'm in real writing mode, that stuff will keep me up all night. I mean, I drive myself mad. It sort of, it used to go into a state of agitation. Um, so that is, it, I'm not a great sleeper, so I think uh, it seems to be getting worse as well. I, I just generally, ideas or, yeah, so I obsess about things a little bit. I have to make lists all the time to calm myself down. So unfinished songs, you know, potential albums, potential album titles. It goes on and on. Uh, so it's it's generally that stuff. Yeah, I won't bother with all the footballers. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, Bob Dylan's got to be there, sort of head and shoulders above anyone else in terms of the way that hearing him has influenced me. And then the, there's a whole sort of battalion of people, everyone from Nina Simone to Talk Talk, Van Morrison, you know, uh, Nick Drake, uh, there's a Leonard Cohen, you know, uh, Joni Mitchell. It's just a, there's a whole sway. Then I've got people like the specials and the Cure. God, I was obsessed with The Cure for ages. I loved them. Saw them live a couple of times in the mid '80s. They were great. Yeah, there was a couple actually. Uh, one was the Water Boys. This is the Sea at Cardiff University, 1985. Uh, they just went straight through the curfew and played for like three hours. But that was such a brilliant record, and he was at the peak of his powers, Mike Scott at that point, and they were, he'd already written songs like Fisherman's Blues and things that appeared later and he played them at the show and I, I remember instantly liking that, having never heard it before and he played a couple of things, he played a couple of covers and he just went on and on and on but the way they all changed instruments, that, uh, I, I loved that show and then the same year I went to Glastonbury for the first time and The Cure headlined Saturday Night uh, that was the Head on the Door album, uh, which was a brilliant record. But they just did a brilliant set, and it was Glastonbury as it used to be, not quite as clean and neat and tidy as it is now. But the Pyramid stage, they had a laser. There used to be a laser. It was like, wow, the laser. Only the headline act could use it. So uh, the Cure got to use the laser, and I was there, out, a bit out of my brains with my little friend from school. Um, and this thunderstorm came in, so the moon was going down, and like the sun was, or rather the moon was coming up, the sun was going down and then this just this huge storm came in and there was thunder and lightning and all the dry ice was being dragged across the stage. It just looked fantastic. And they just played through all this stuff. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. I was, abs I was blown away by Glastonbury, the whole thing of it. I was so obsessed by music. I must have seen about 40 bands. Uh, but The Cure, was, that was the best bit. God, I don't know, you know. It's, I just can't look, I can't look back and see it all as good and bad advice uh, because it all has just led to me getting here. So it's like, well, what if I turned left there? Well, then something else would have happened. Maybe I wouldn't have made it. So it's like, you know, signed with EMI uh, in America. It was, that was, there was no one gave me that advice, but I bloody did it. I had some options too. I could have signed with other people. Uh, that was... Uh, the worst part of my early musical career. 
that was a wilderness years. It was a complete fiasco, and the company was obviously completely screwed and uh, just sort of descending into chaos. And there was no chance of the record even getting a, the slightest whiff of any airplay, or it was just miserable. The whole thing was miserable. I think recording recording in America as well on that record was a mistake with um, the guy out of Grantley Buffalo, uh, the bass player. I really liked Grantley Buffalo's records back then, Fuzzy and the one that came after it. So I thought they were just right and sort of produced just enough. So I got this guy, but he was essentially just a bit of a chancer. And I think just sort of looked at the p big record company, big budget. Wow, loads of money for me. I think that was pretty, pretty much the size of it. And he said, we want to record. I, wanted, I said, I want to record in America. You know what I mean? He said, yeah. And he had a mate. Anyway, we recorded out in Ithaca in New York in some, some guy's studio. That was a disastrous episode. So that and, that and signing to EMI in the first place were probably regrettable acts, but I, I don't really see them in that light anymore. They're just things that happen. Character building.